Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 381. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. This week's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes, the number one rated electronic health record system available today. With live telephone support seven days a week, it's clear why Therapy Notes is rated 4.9 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot and has a 5-star rating on Google. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. And now, for all you prescribers out there, Therapy Notes is proudly introducing ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan. And if you listened to episode 380 last week, my interview with Linda Tai, you might have been expecting to hear part two of that conversation today. And that is also what I was expecting to bring to you. But like I said last time, that was our intention. But intentions don't always work out as expected. Linda wasn't able to record with me last week as we had hoped. We are planning to record this week our part two, and I don't know if we'll be able to do a part three or not. We're just going to have to see how things go. But we had such a beautiful conversation, and I really wanted to bring you more on grief because I feel that collectively there is a lot of grief happening. Every therapist I know is in some way, dealing with some kind of grief. And most people I know in my personal life are as well. So I don't think that my therapist friends and and my personal life friends and I are, are anomalies. I think that this is representative of what is happening collectively right now. And for that reason, I want to help shed light on grief. And it's not all negative. <laughs> and I don't think I believed that before, really. I had a very avoidant relationship to death in general before 2004 when my grandmother died, but the experience of being with her leading up to her death and what the hospice social worker basically at that time, the hospice social worker really helped me to look at death as another stage of life, another part rather than something to be feared and avoided at all costs since that's impossible. I mean, we want to stay alive, but we will all die at some point. So so I was quite averse to even thinking about death. And I think that, again, that is something that is common in Western culture. But gradually, as time goes by and and we grow, we can learn to accept and embrace that life has cycles and death is part of the cycle of of life. And we can learn to not be so afraid of it and find healing and meaning through the mourning and grief process. So this week, instead of my part two with Linda Tai, since we weren't able to do that yet, I'm, I'm replaying a past episode in 2019, I interviewed Isabel Stenzel Burns, and we had such a deep, meaningful conversation, and I was pretty blown away by her. Like with Linda, she has a very deep reverence for life and death and and love and connection. And that's not because she's never struggled or had loss. It's in spite of, or maybe because of it. I'm getting emotional, and I'll explain why in a second, but Isabel is an LCSW and also has a master's in public health. She has been a grief counselor and hospice social worker for a long time, and she also has an intimate relationship with death due to having cystic fibrosis, which when she was born, 
was a an illness that most people did not survive to adulthood with. And she had a twin sister. She and her sister both had CF and they both had lung transplants. And her sister later passed away from cancer, unfortunately. And Isabel has a TED Talk called The Art of Saying Goodbye. These will be linked in the show notes. This conversation was part one, and we had a part two that came out a few months later. When when part one came out in March 2019, I was feeling a lot of anticipatory grief and concern for one of my parents' health declining. I didn't know that that parent would almost die later that year and then not die, which if you've listened to therapy chat before, you've heard me talk a little bit about that. I've never talked a lot about it, and I may talk more about that sometime soon. But, you know, things have a way of happening in the right timing. I think that this conversation helped me to come to terms with and be more ready to accept what happened later that year when my loved one's health really took a serious decline and they nearly passed away to the point that we had said goodbye and everything. And then later that year in October, while the near death was still happening, our second interview together came out. And so I would say my grief was heavily infused in both of these episodes this one and the part two, which I might release next week. We'll see what happens with the Linda Ty conversation. So on top of that, I I haven't talked to Isabel in a while. I haven't talked to her since the pandemic and since before the pandemic. And um, so unfortunately, tonight when I went to release this, I, I suddenly thought I should Google her. And I Googled her name and I found that she has cancer at this time. So thankfully, Isabel is still living. And I hope she will hear this because I'm very grateful for her. I'm in awe of the courage that it takes to be present to a terminal diagnosis or a potentially life-ending illness. To be able to face that and keep showing up for yourself and living your life, it's really beautiful. Staying present to what is, as painful as it is, is I think it's the hardest task of being human. And I'm grateful that I have had the opportunity to speak with Isabel for these two interviews, this one and the second one that I will link to in the show notes and probably release next week, but we'll see. She has so much wisdom to share in listening to this now I took in many different learnings that may not have landed the same way before. So I hope this will benefit you too. And as always, I appreciate you listening. Thank you for your support. I think one of the things that is so important for us all to remember is that we're not alone. If you're in pain, you're not alone. If you're grieving, if you're afraid, you're not alone. So that's it for now. I'm excited to share this episode with you and I appreciate you listening and I'll talk to you soon. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today, I am so honored to be speaking with someone who has a very important perspective to share about subjects that we often don't talk about, grief and loss, bereavement, anticipatory grief, hospice care. My guest today is Isabel Stencil Burns. Isabel, thanks so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. It's a great honor to be here, Laura. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy that we made it work and that you were able to come. And just as we've been talking before we even started with the formal part of our interview, I've just been struck by, you know, just how meaningful and powerful the work that you're doing is. So I can't wait for our audience to hear us discussing it. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So before we really dive into our conversation, will you just take a moment to introduce yourself and tell our audience about who you are and what you do? 
So I am a licensed clinical social worker in California. I work at Mission Hospice and Home Care in San Mateo between San Francisco and San Jose. I am a bereavement coordinator at the hospice, so I predominantly offer grief counseling on an individual basis to clients, as well as family counseling, and we offer a number of grief support groups. So those are my main roles here. I also do a lot of community education. And I'll just start with where I, how I landed here. Perfect. I actually, when I was young, I wanted to be a park ranger <laughs> because I love the outdoors. I love nature. But I was born with an illness with my twin sister, Annabelle, and cystic fibrosis. And so we were diagnosed in, back in 1972 when we were born. And throughout my life, I did quite a bit of medical treatments. And my parents uh, were told that we wouldn't live to be more than about 10 years of age. So we grew up with a lot of illness and death and anxiety and really had to navigate how to try to live as normal a life as possible in the midst of multiple medications, treatments, and hospitalizations. What helped me the most was being part of a community of children with cystic fibrosis by going to camp and later being involved in various nonprofit organizations. And inevitably, when you're part of an illness community, I experienced a number of losses, friends of peers of children that were younger than me and adults who were older than me. And I was really fascinated and drawn to living parents. There was some connection that I felt for them. And probably there was some unconscious need for me to process their grief or because I anticipated my own. But also just it, it was it was really just fascinating to see how they coped with the death of a child. How did they s remember their child? How did they start living again and restart their lives? How did they honor their child and really find ways to continue to c feel connected to their child? So that that kind of experience started when I was about 17, being drawn to parents of my peers who had died. And lo and behold, I was in the hospital many times, and it was my social worker in the hospital that introduced me to this work. And she was really an incredible mentor and talk about life and death and anxieties and so on. I feel so blessed to have had, you know, a, a close relationship with my medical social worker through the years. So first, my mother went to social work school and then started working at the same hospital. And then eventually, after my college, I went to Berkeley for my social work degree and got a public health degree as well. And because of my progressive illness, I basically worked for about three years. And then I became too sick to work. So that was a time of tremendous grief for, for me. Actually, my whole life, I was struggling with wanting to be normal and pushing myself, sometimes to the extreme, to be able to accomplish what my peers accomplished. The blessing of this kind of, and I know my story is not unique. Most people who end up doing this work come from backgrounds and histories that inform how they cope with challenge and then, you know, get interested in helping others to find ways to cope with challenges. So I just say that because I'm mindful of our audience and all the stories out there of how people coped and what led them to become therapists. So I, I was enduring the realization that no matter how many treatments I did, no matter how compliant I was with my nutrition and my exercise and sleep and chest physical therapy and medications, I still had a progressive and fatal disease. So my grief process probably started when I was six years old, when I was in the hospital, there was fibrosis in the room down the hall. And the next one day her bed was empty and the nurse explained to us that she had gone to heaven. And it was a realization, okay, I am here temporarily. I will, I will likely die. I didn't say likely back then. I said, I will die 
I will die before my peers, my healthy peers. So I really need to live the best life I can live. And I was six years old when I came to that realization. Gosh, what a what a realization for a child. Yeah. Yeah, that I, it, it, but it was actually, I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm overly positive, but I did learn to cope in, in positive ways. But it was an opportunity and actually a gift for me to recognize, okay, I have no control over this disease. I, I, I do have some control because of the adherence and psychologically, I have a tremendous amount of control. I can, you know, embrace life, what's given to me. I can love the people around me at a, at a very young age. Mm. I can express myself and learn to, you know, learn to make a, an emotional impact initially and further down to make a, an actual practical impact in the career that I chose. So throughout all of this, I lost my best friend when I was 19 and then a number of other friends through the years. And the reason I came to Mission Hospice was because both my sister and I received double lung transplants, and that's why I'm still here. And after 13 years of her transplants, my sister unfortunately developed cancer, and she was a patient at Mission Hospice and went through three weeks of hospice. Really just transformative. The doctor here spent three hours with her, and we would never, ever in our whole medical life have had that much time with the doctor. The focus on the psychosocial, spiritual, and physical needs were something we'd never experienced before. And despite a tragic illness, my sister died a peaceful death surrounded by friends and comfort and love. So it was, a, it was a, if it had to be a death, it was a positive experience. It was a good death. And a number of months later, the medical director let me know about a job opening here. So my heart has always been in bereavement. I was a bereavement counselor at the time of my sister's death. And predominantly what we, what we do is individual counseling, but we also do community counseling as well for people who've lost a loved one suddenly or tragically or maybe somewhere else you know, outside of this region and have found us for support. Wonderful. Oh, gosh, what an important... I was telling you before before we started recording that, you know, hospice in my life has was invaluable when someone I loved was dying. And, you know, it's it's such a it's different from anything else that that we have, like in in our culture, I think that, you know, it approaches everything with a different perspective. It approaches the end of life process with a different perspective from our usual medical perspective. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's just so for the people who both for the person who's dying, but also for the people who love them, it's just it's precious. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And and just to re reiterate what you said, I think we live in a de death defying culture. And finally, there is a place where we accept that death is a natural part of life. And that all of us, whether we're 95 years old or sometimes 30 years old, we will die. And to be able to surrender to that and also let go of that valiant fight, which our medical system really promotes, you know, try this drug, try this drug, try this chemo. What about this radiation? What about this surgery? The fight that can go on until a person has no quality of life. Finally, when patients come to hospice, obviously not not willingly, nobody wants to come to this stage of their, their illness. Surrender. I've had patients tell me, couldn't be happier in my life because the sense of new peace is discovered that yeah. I, I, my time is limited, but I can choose what I want to do with it. No more trips to the ER, no more infusions. I get to just be with family and friends. Yeah. Well, and I, I, don't want to skip over just thanking you for sharing your own experience because it was, to me, for me, that was very poignant to hear. And I just want to honor that you shared that with Thank us because you. that's precious too. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I'm a humble person, but I also recognize 
by going to conferences and talking to many grief counselors that many, many people who do grief counseling have had a loss of their own. Why I became a grief counselor, of course, is informed by my own struggle against trying not to die and fighting death and actually coming to a place, and if you don't mind me sharing a little more, no, where I declined and basically went into respiratory failure, saw the white light, had a profound near-death experience, and then went unconscious. And so I was put on a ventilator. I was on the list waiting for a transplant. And a couple of days later, I woke up with someone else's lungs inside of me. So when, when I talk to clients and patients about death, I obviously do not reveal my personal story. But deep inside of me, I have an awareness of the physical struggle, of how the emotions and emotions are set aside at the end of life because of the physical struggle. And there's just a, a comfort and familiarity that I have in this work that I'm actually really grateful for. It's like this work found me <laughs> and everything I've been through, all of the challenges, the grief, the hardships, the loss, the defiance against this disease, it all kind of has meaning and makes sense that I'm doing this, this work. Really grateful. Yeah. And it's, you know, and that when you shared how you had that realization when you were six about, I'm here for a short time and, you know, kind of like, what am I going to make of it? That's so profound. You know, that's kind of like a spiritual realization that most people, you know, it's it's true of all of us. We're here for a certain amount of time. We just don't know how long. And so for a child to be able to and maybe it maybe it was through guidance and mentorship and maybe what your parents were able to help you understand. Or maybe it was just something that your own child's wisdom really came up with yourself. but. That's a hard thing for anybody to to grasp at any age and for a child to have that awareness is it's like painful to hear, but it's also beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And and speaking for myself, I don't know the experience of other children, obviously, but that I had the capacity inside of me to to know and to understand that I happened to that girl down the hall for me. Well, then it's going to happen to me. So how do I want to live my life? And I also want to just mention that my parents were amazing. They did so much for my sister and I and my brother to survive as a family. But it was really the nurses and the respiratory therapists and the doctors and the social workers at the hospital who raised me mm. because they, they had enough distance that they could ask are you afraid of dying? Let me give you this book, Getting to Know God. You know, one of the nurses gave me that when I was 12. Mm. And, and they had sort of the courage and the authenticity to approach me as a, as a young, sick kid and really just allow me to talk. I don't think I would have been able to gain the personal awareness and courage with death and dying and grief if I hadn't had those companions along the way to guide me. So that's just my little shout out to all the healthcare providers out there, whether they're listening or not. <laughs> you're sending it out to the universe. I think that you're really making me realize that, I mean, I know this, but I want to say it explicitly that healthcare providers who take care of people when they're sick and dying, or when they're sick and they're not expected to die, but you know, healthcare providers who do direct care with people mm -hmm. see so much that the rest of us don't see about life and death. And, yeah. you know, and they really do have to keep it to themselves, just like us as therapists having to witness so much pain that people experience and we just carry it and hold it. And we know, but that's a that's a really sacred honor to yeah. be with people in those those times when they're their most vulnerable, they're their most sick, helpless, dying, alone, you know, all of those experiences that can be so challenging for people mm -hmm. and the people who walk alongside with them in that 
experience are really important, you know? Yes. Really. Yes. And, and that does, thank you for acknowledging that. It does highlight there is an intimacy, profound intimacy with people who are at our bedside and watching us suffer. There was one respiratory therapist in particular who really tried to keep me alive before I went into respiratory failure. And and he knew he had to do my treatments. I protested them, retired. And and then he went, he went, you know, he was off for a couple of days and he came back and I was alive with new lungs. And he came to me and he just cried and cried. And I was so touched. I thought, I'm just one of many patients, but he had developed kind of, and this is kind of a cold word, but an investment in my survival because he was taking care of me and had taken care of me actually for years when I was in and out of the hospital. So there's the intimacy and sometimes we have to be mindful that that can create some and the healthy boundaries because I've had Parents of my friends who died and after the funeral, you know, sometimes healthcare providers come and sometimes they don't. And one parent in particular was so angry. She said, I, you know, they treated me, my daughter just, and, uh, and I kind of said to her, well, she was, she was one of many patients. And so we cross boundaries as kind of notorious in the cystic versus community of thinking of our providers as our friends. Mm. But just have to be careful with that because the expectations can change and can be potentially, you know, leading to disappointment. That's a good perspective. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. So Isabel, let's shift gears a little and and see if we could talk about your work with grief. You know, your personal experience of grief certainly informs your work, but as you are sharing with those who are listening. I mean, some in the audience are therapists and some may be other types of helping professionals. And then many people are, you know, everyone will experience grief at some point. So, you know, many who are listening are people who don't work in this profession, but, you know, they want to understand more about themselves and life. And what would you want people to know about grief and in your work with grief? Right. Yeah, there's so much. I think first and foremost, I want to acknowledge just my own experience in graduate school. I did not have a lot of training in grief and grief and loss. I had none. Yeah. And most of my colleagues and peers and even talking to professors at social work schools, like there, this is still the case. There's very little training on grief and loss, even though grief and loss is such a omnipresent theme, whether in therapy or whether in medical social work or child protective services, it's a part of our career, this this profession. So most of my my education was working here and started reading William Morden and Therese Rando and Ken Doka and all of these prominent people in the grief, grief and loss world. But it was sitting with clients that is my greatest education. And to to kind of The blessing, I think, in this work is that grief and loss is a normal and natural experience. We do not diagnose. We do not pathologize. We really, most of my work is around normalizing and validating a person's experience and sitting in front of them non-judgmentally and compassionately witnessing their story. Rather than being a storyteller, we are, I, I don't know what the opposite of a storyteller is. We are story recipients. And we soak in the stories. You know, sometimes people need to tell the story. Actually, not sometimes, many times. People need to tell the story. What do they see? It's sort of a way of processing something very traumatic, right? Absolutely. Um, how did the person sound? Because most of us aren't familiar with, with death. We don't have it happening in our kitchen or our, our, our grandparents aren't dying in the bedroom next door anymore like it was back in the day when we lived in a farmhouse or something like that. So we're not exposed to death. So when it does happen to the closest person in our life, it is incredibly difficult. So many, most of my clients have never experienced such intense emotions. They feel like they're going crazy. They've never had such intense 
physiological distress, like not being able to sleep and not being able to eat and feeling tension and feeling literal physical pain because their loved one has died and is not here. So, so what a break in attachment looks like, what it means, what it, how, we, how we move through that and integrate that loss. And, you know, if I could sum up grief counseling in one word, it would be the word allow, because so many people, you know, receive messages, perhaps from our society or the media, that grief starts and then it needs to stop. And it needs to stop soon, within three days, because that's all of bereavement. Three days, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Got three days and, for that. Right. Three days of bereavement. And, and if not three days, it should stop in three months or at most six months. I've even had clients saying, you know, I want to be better by March. And, and so I have to kind of gently explore that, but also validate that, you know, sometimes we can't control this process. And to lose a child or to lose your parent, you have a new, new kind of, you know, there was the chapter before when you were with them and then the chapter where you're not with them. And what we also do is help them not judge themselves. People are pretty harsh to themselves, as you know, in, in therapy. Mm -hmm. They set high expectations for themselves to be able to be more functional, to be able to be more at peace with what is a, a significant break in attachment. And so, you know, I, I do a lot of education around what that means um, to lose, to experience such loss of security and safety because their close person is no longer here. Many times in grief counseling, we review the relationship. What was it like? There's a myth that people that go to grief counseling love their, love their per person's whole relationship and all is well and how devastated they are that they're gone. But we try to review the full relationship, the good parts of the person and the challenging parts and what they're grieving that they're missing and what they might even be glad they don't have to deal with anymore, even if it might be the trips to the ER or the suffering. And then, you know, I think my, my job, just like any counselor, any therapist, is to kind of help a client establish confidence little by little. So I've you know, like, like the little old lady who tells me, guess what? I, I drove across the bridge today because her husband always drove her across the bridge. And for the first time she did it. So, and it, and it extends beyond that. You know, I made a new friend or I cooked myself a meal and I ate it and I wasn't in a puddle of tears. So helping gradually restart their lives again and, and gain more confidence in who they are and what they're capable of. Yeah. Running a group private practice has been a challenging and rewarding experience. And one thing that has made it so much easier is Therapy Notes. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. If you're coming from another EHR, like I did, Therapy Notes makes the transition incredibly easy, importing your demographic data free of charge so you can get going right away. My team has found Therapy Notes very easy to learn. It's intuitive. The customer support is second to none. And that's one of the things that has kept me a Therapy Notes customer for several years now. Anytime I've needed to contact Therapy Notes for help with an issue I couldn't figure out on my own, I've been able to get through to someone and resolve the issue within 15 minutes, 99% of the time. Find out what more than 100,000 mental health professionals already know. Try Therapy Notes for two months absolutely free. Just click on the link in the show notes or enter the promo code chat at therapynotes.com. I, I, you know, what you're saying resonates so much for me in terms of people wanting to return to their normal functioning and thinking that they're supposed to and other people outside in their lives telling them that they are, you know, taking too long to heal, Ooh. you know, and that's certainly a common theme for, you know, my clients mostly have complex trauma and there are a lot of like, are you still, why are you still dealing with that from 30 years ago? That doesn't, you should be over that by now. You need to let it go, you know, and people do the same thing to themselves and their people in their lives do the same thing to them about recovering from grief or healing 
grief that the process is supposed to be done quickly in, you know, maybe a month max. <laughs> yeah. And so much of what I kind of say is reframing the situation. Okay. So you were married for 60 years and three months has passed. So do you think it's fair that, you know, you should be well adjusted by now if you were together for that amount of time? So just, you know, again, offering a gentle way to allow people to really struggle with this grief. Yeah. And and to recognize and challenge our cultural messages that we're getting. I think the bottom line is that most people in our culture have a very hard time with intense, strong emotions. Mm -hmm. And so when their friend or their family member is fragile and falls into tears, and so they try to fix it by saying, you need to get better. How about this? Try this. What about this? And give advice like that. But I wish I wished we lived in a culture where difficult emotions were as acceptable and as honored as positive emotion. Me too. In our yeah. culture, everybody thinks if you're not happy, then something's wrong. You know, yeah. and it's like, yes, you may be feeling sad. So in a way, there's something that isn't how you want it to be. But that doesn't mean that those feelings are wrong. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Another thing that you said that resonated deeply with me is that people didn't always have such perfect relationships. And we tend to sort of like put someone who passes away on a pedestal, too. So, yes. you know, that's like, oh, you can't say anything negative about that person because they passed away. But, you know, again, with since so many of my clients have complex trauma, oftentimes the grief that they have, they may have had a negative relationship with someone like, let's say, an abusive parent. Mm-hmm. And so when the person dies, the the person will think, you know, I should be glad. Why do I feel all of these mixed feelings or, mm-hmm. you know, and so there's a lot of like judging how one reacts as not being correct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And also to help clients understand attachment, that we can be in- attached to people who are imperfect that hurt us, but they're still our closest, you know, family member or somebody that we turn to for safety that gives us some security just because they're there and then suddenly they're gone. It is very complicated. It is. And a lot of like there's, I wish I was like your other speakers and could cite authors and things like that, but I don't, <laughs> don't have worry about it. <laughs> I'm not good at that either. <laughs> yeah. But I, I read a book on caregiving and it was, it was about caregiving as a rite of passage. And they did a study on grieving caregivers after the death of the patient. And the number one emotion that was present in those caregivers was not sadness. It wasn't grief as we traditionally think of it, but it was relief. Uh-huh. And sometimes my clients need permission to feel relief yeah. that, our, that that person has died, either because the suffering just couldn't go on as a person declined. Also relief for the caregiver that their 24-7 sort of exhaustion is over. Yeah. And, you know, and I think about the stress of caregiving. I think one of the things about the stress of caregiving, especially when, you know, someone has continued hospitalizations or, you know, a lot of crises, events that happen along the way in the caregiving, you know, that it's like, I think one of the things that makes the stress, this is just my opinion based on experience, that one of the things that makes the stress of caregiving so difficult is that the person is anticipating, is this it? Is this it? Is this it? You know, and and I have to keep this person alive and we're going to try this. We're going to try that. We're going to try this. And it's like they never get to let their guard down at all, you know, so just the amount of tension that they would hold just from that constantly, you know, and for the other person, the person who's sick, they're going through it. So, of course, it's horrible for them. But for the caregiver, they're like a step removed. They're not going through it. They're just witnessing it all and feeling responsible for it all. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that makes it. So hard and why many caregivers have symptoms that would meet the PTSD yeah. criteria. Exactly. Exactly. Grief counseling is often 
traumatic grief. And, and yes, especially in the acute phase of grief, the, there are, are many traumatic symptoms. And also, you know, the physiological symptoms after death of a loved one is predominantly fatigue, just absolute exhaustion. Most of my clients are just exhausted and it's, it's likely a result of the loss, but also likely a result of just what you're describing. Months and months, if not years of, of hypervigilance yeah. and 24-hour kind of alertness about what's going to happen next. Yeah. I do a lot of work and I know a lot of therapists do on guilt, a guilt around, did I do enough? Or maybe we should have gone to the doctor earlier. Or I went and I went as a grieving person, I went to my friend's party and I feel terrible because I had a good time and I shouldn't be having a good time because it somehow dishonors the person who died. So it's really the, the grieving person's process to make peace with that or sort of find a way to talk to themselves and recognize that to live again, it's okay to have positive emotion while they're grieving at the same time. You know, some people have a myth that like, I'm going to grieve first and then I'm going to go back to work or I'm going to go, you know, on that trip. I'm going to grieve first. But the truth is like, we have to both grieve and live our lives at the same time because, you know, grief takes that much time. We usually don't have the luxury of kind of standing still for, you know, for however long it takes. But we need to take turns. We can't do it all. We need to take turns focusing on our grief and going to counseling and groups and writing in a journal or just being still and, and being reflective about our grief. And then taking a break from it by living our lives and going out with friends. I think a lot of people need permission to do that. Yeah. And I think that I've seen people have a lot of guilt about resuming their normal lives after someone dies who they love. Like, you know, if a spouse dies and the the person who the widow or widower begins to date. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of guilt about, am I allowed to do this? Is it wrong? Does it mean I didn't love them? Right. And really guiding them through those thoughts. And and again, sort of using the principles of self-compassion. If you had a friend who was grieving a loss and, and you, you saw that they were dating again, how would you feel about what they're doing? You know, just seems giving yourself some distance. And recognizing that it would be perfectly fine, that that person has a right to be happy and to not be lonely. I do want to mention that one of the tasks of grief counseling is really to guide people through their own process. And if there are concerns, to highlight them and pursue further treatment. So one of the things I do is complicated grief treatment, which is developed by Dr. Catherine Shear at Columbia. And it's an evidence-based treatment, 16-week treatment program that really guides people through some of the greatest barriers in, in those who are stuck in their grief. So one of the most important aspects. I said the most important word for grief was allow, but I'm going to say another word. The other word is accept. Mm. To accept that the person has one of the tasks that Willie Warden has put out and Alan Wolfelt and to accept and not just to accept intellectually because most people say, yeah, yeah, I've accepted it. Yeah, I saw them take their last breath. But it's not just that. It's fully emotionally, spiritually, intrinsically accepting that that person is gone they're not coming back and I am still here. Now what? And really recognizing the, the now what? What are the choices I have? Recognizing the importance of the past and the role of memories in helping us connect to the person, but also, you know, now what? How are you going to live your life with that person no longer here? How are you going to establish new attachments? We all need attachments. That's the basis of being human. And a lot of the work I do in grief counseling is around social support. And it's really sad for me when there's a number of people out there that have no one with whom they are intimate. What I mean by intimate is no one they can confide in. You know, today I'm feeling this way. Today I'm having a hard day. And that's why I think support groups are so important in the grief process, because that's a safe place where people can come and 
and really sh- tell it like it is. But that again, we we don't have a culture where people always are there on a mo- an emotional level. And I'm I, again coming back to my own personal experience. This is what makes me grateful for the life I've lived because I have always had a, a cystic fibrosis community. And the transplant community is the same. So again, it's something I hold inside of myself. I don't reveal this. But to have a place of belonging, I preface this because I am very active in the cystic fibrosis and transplant community. To have a place of belonging is such a basic human need. And when we don't have that and we experience a significant loss, we can feel completely lost, unmoored. Yeah. 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 And I mean, honestly, you know, I would say one of the unintended positive consequences of being a child with CF is that you had a a community, you know, yeah, who was who could relate to what you were going through. And that's somehow in our culture, that's not as common in in everyday life to have, you know, communities that are built on shared emotional experiences, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Communities around like that we all play soccer or that we, you know, that we all go to this school, but the emotional part is often not there. Yeah. And luckily, you know, Alan, Alanon and AA have Mm -hmm. really opened up the self-help movement and that, that there are places people can turn to if they identify with a certain group. And I think, again, coming to grief and the word acceptance, I think that also applies to people who are living with illness, that we need to accept that this is our life and this is what we have and we, we're going to live with this disease and we are going to be different. The reality that this is my life. And only after doing that could I feel like, okay, so I have cystic fibrosis. It's not going to go away. It's really messing up a lot of my life, which is but I belong to this group because everyone else has CF. Is I've also witnessed so many kids and teens and adults who don't want to identify. They don't want to accept that they have this disease. So they push it away and resist. And unfortunately, that often is accompanied with noncompliance and, and then worsening health. So it's a real struggle. It can cost your life to to on the path of acceptance or yeah i know i'm kind of jumping all over the place here but this is what conversation is about yeah no i i value so much all the things that you've shared i wish we had more time to talk today because you know everything that you're talking about is just so important and perhaps we'll be able to talk again and go into more depth but i think for now this was a really helpful conversation. And I think like if I were listening and probably when I do listen back, I'll be saying, oh, yeah, like (laughs) because, you know, the way you presented the information was very thought provoking. And I love the perspective that you bring. So but I just want to say one more thing about grief counseling and, and why it's so rich is that grief is often like a spotlight. It will highlight family dysfunction. It will highlight devastating low self-esteem because of the death of the loved one. We can recognize all the other mental health challenges somebody is, is undergoing. And so part of my role is supporting a person through their grief process, but also recognizing the symptoms, the underlying challenges, and and maybe even the unhealthy or maladaptive patterns that they've lived with all their life. And grief offers them an opportunity to challenge that or get additional support for their depression or be recognized as having trauma. And so it opens up new areas in a person's life to really help them live the best possible life they can that may not have been possible if that. So this is why I, I love my work is that it's sort of it's not just about grief. It's about all of the issues that our clients who walk through the door present to us and really exploring how those issues impact their grief and how their grief impacts their their other issues as well. Thank you for sharing that. I really, I'm glad that you added that in because, yeah, that's beautiful. That's true. And somehow the grief is what 
presents the opportunity for the person to get the help that they also needed before this happened. Yes, yes exactly. Well, well, thank you for having me and thank you for having a, se- a segment on grief and for being so interested and open to my personal story. It's always very meaningful to share. And uh, thank you, Laura. No, I'm, I'm very grateful that you were my guest today. And I will let you know, too, I think I might have told you this when we first corresponded about setting this up, that people have been asking me to have guests on to talk about grief. So this is something that the audience has been wanting to hear more about. So I'm very grateful that you took your time to share your perspective today. And all the resources that you mentioned, I will put links to in the show notes. But before we completely wrap up, is there any anything you want to tell our audience about where they can find you? Or I know, you know, the work you're doing, but there is something else that you have created. I know that you didn't mention. Would you like to tell people about that? Yes, thank you. I, I am sort of intrinsically humble. And so my <laughs> I, I'm a terrible marketer. I'm a terrible marketer. But what I did do is write a book, a memoir called The Power of Two, along with my twin sister. And it really was meant to be a document, our love for each other. I'm so grateful I wrote that book because it is a lasting legacy of what we had together. And that book became a movie. It's called The Power of Two also a documentary film highlighting our work in Japan, advocating for organ donation. And my mother's Japanese, by the way. Mm. And so those two experiences allowed me to tell my story and really, again, gain personal insight on this path and help me basically kind of come to terms with if so that I have the clarity and the focus to really work with other people and their issues. It kind of helped me take care of my own stuff. Right. And that's, I had, I really transformed by writing the book. It helped me gain perspective. It helped me grieve the people who died. It really helped me organize my life and see not just the negative challenges, but also the positive and gain some new insight about this path. And so that's one of the reasons, I, if you don't mind me mentioning at my hospice, I also lead writing through loss groups and oh. really advocate, advocate, as you do, for people to write out their stories and write out their relationship, to tell the story of the love that they had for this person and the loss, what it means now for themselves, what their grief is like. And these writing through loss groups have been successful here at Mission Hospice. And if anybody has interest in those, they're welcome to contact me as well. The book and the film are available on my website, thepowerof2movie.com. And if anybody's interested in further grief information, I am working at Mission Hospice, and our website is missionhospice.org. And our phone number is 650-554-1000. And I do do consultations and grief education presentations, and I could talk a lot more. I could probably do another session on just sort of the process of grief work in more depth, but I'm happy to share and and spread the knowledge if people are interested. Well, I'm glad I asked. (laughs) So they can find your book and the film. (laughs) They can find the book and the film on thepowerof2movie.com. It feels like it's just like that, what you said when you were little, like, what am I going to do with this life? And then you've made you know, meaningful contribution day to day in your work. And then something that you, that, that will always be there, the book and the film, you know, is there's so much potential for those and all of the, the training and teaching that you're doing to help so many more people help so many more people. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for having me. Thank you for being a wonderful interviewer and guiding this session so nicely to help include so many different themes and topics. I really, that was very helpful. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for being my guest today. And I hope we may resume, you know, come back and have another conversation about maybe the process of grief therapy work. And because, you know, we barely had a chance to touch on that, but I would love to bring that if you, if you have time and you're scheduled to do it. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. Thank you.
Thank you to Therapy Notes for sponsoring this week's episode. I do love Therapy Notes. It's such an asset to my business and makes my job as a practice owner and a therapist much easier. Try it today with no strings attached to see why everyone is switching to Therapy Notes, now featuring ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.